My name is Reverend Alice Reed, and I'm so happy to be with you here this morning. What a week we've had. Wow. We've had a peaceful transmission of power, something we weren't sure was going to happen, and then the inaugural celebration and the, the uh, activities that happened on Wednesday. Um, I know that m many of you were filled with hope as a, uh, after watching, um, listening to our new president, after watching the first woman African-American of Asian descent be sworn in as our vice president. It was quite a historic week. And one of the things that I think you might have noticed, as I certainly did, was that there was a young poet that really stole the show. Her name is Amanda Gorman. And I watched this interview of her. Uh, James Corden brought her on her show. She's been interviewed by everybody. But this, in this particular interview, I heard her answer a question, question that um, James put to her. How did it feel to be standing on the steps of the Capitol when just two weeks ago there was so much unrest and, and rioting there and here she was two weeks later in this amazing ceremony and I want to just share her quote with you. As I stood in this place at the capital of our nation I thought here is basically a chapel that has been violated and the way we bring sense of sacredness back to this space is in our actions and in our words. And words is where I operate and where I can make magic happen. My calling was using my hymn to try to repurify that space. Wow. wow. So let's listen. I, I'm sure you've heard the poem already, but let's listen to it again this morning. And what I'm going to encourage you to do is to really listen with your mind and your heart and even with your body as she uses that poem as a, as a prayer so that she could, in her words, repurify the seat of our nation's democracy. Wow. I felt compelled to share that with you once again this morning in context of what we're talking about. Amanda's brilliance captures what many of us yearn for unity, for healing, and for moving forward. Ernest Holmes said, the spiral of life is upward. Evolution carries us forward. And this month we've been looking at the broad brushstrokes of this um, powerful annual theme of timeless wisdom evolutionary vision. And timeless wisdom is evidenced by our declaration of principles and evolutionary vision by our global vision. And both of these documents can be found on our website. I encourage you to go to, to look at them, to become familiar with them, because they are truly the, the grounding for where we stand and the uh, wind beneath our wings for where we want to go to. I want to uh, look again at that quote from Sunday Cote, who was the inspiration for much of this week's talk. Um, she says, there has been a clear evolution in our teaching, not necessarily in our timeless principles. So the evolution is really in the teaching of the principles, not the principles themselves, as they stand grounded in purpose and in truth. She goes on to talk about how our teaching was truly birthed as a teaching of mind and thought, and yet we have evolved as we have brought our whole selves into this philosophy. We have evolved into a teaching of the heart. And next, we need to evolve into a wider circle of full empowerment so that we can realize this powerful idea of our global vision of a world that works for all. So today, in the few minutes that I have, I want to look at where we've been, where we're going, and how we're going to get there. Wish me luck. <laughs> in our centering statement, we say each week that we are a spiritually progressive community and that we're transformative through this thing called possibility thinking and expressing our lives through love. We do this through our education and application of this teaching called Science of Mind and through the community we build through our centers for spiritual living that are located everywhere. And so where we've been a hundred years ago, this philosophy was originally, and I say this with affection, a neck up teaching. 
It was a teaching that called to us to really begin to pay attention to and to gestate and to cultivate our thoughts and our mind and the way that we thought, and we did that expertly. And then in the last 25 years, we've been integrating the heart. We've been really bringing the feeling tone and the, and the, uh, the true heart to this teaching and, and how it can be expressed. And to evolve fully, we need the body. And I mean not only our physical body, but the body of creation. I know that, and, and as we teach in our classes and, and how we talk about on Sunday mornings, that the body not only represents our own physical body temple, but it also represents the body of God as it is expressed in all material creation. And so we need to remember to bring all of that with us, to integrate it fully, so that we can begin to step out into this highest idea of a world that works for everyone. And being in touch with our body and being in touch with creation really connects us in a way that nothing else can. It's, it can be very academic to just be paying attention to our thoughts. And it can be a wonderful, passionate, juicy place to be in our heart with our feelings and our emotions. But it is the body that demonstrates how all of that is in alignment with creation. And so I'm inviting you to really play that beautiful game of spiritual hokey pokey. <laughs> where we are all in. We bring our whole selves in so that we can bring our whole selves out. And what I'm really talking about, my friends, is inclusion on a very grand scale. And this is where we're going, radical inclusion. In diversity circles, inclusion is often talked about including diverse populations in all that what we do, and that we've been, we've been learning that inclusion isn't enough to say, come play in my sandbox with my toys the way I like to play. Inclusion is really about inviting people in so we can decide if we even want to play in a sandbox, so that diverse voices and genders and uh, people who are differently abled can come and bring the richness of who they are to whatever we're doing so that it can become something more can become something more. But in our complex world, it requires deep self-awareness to see beyond our differences to the richness of our allness. And our differences will continue to divide us if we can't see past our own experiences. What sometimes hold us, holds us back is this propensity to not want to feel discomfort or deal with discord. And so as we look at this idea of radical inclusion, we also have to take into account that oftentimes it's very tempting to do what I call a spiritual bypass. And what the spiritual bypass does is it feels it's when an individual or a culture or a group or a community feels some discord or some discomfort and goes right to prayer. Instead of taking a moment to see what that discord has come up to teach us, to see what is wanting to be teased out so that we can remove our power from the things that aren't serving us and include and embrace and integrate that which needs to come with us as we move to that higher place, that higher realm within ourselves and within our communities. Healing happens through revealing, and revealing happens through individual and collective awareness. 2020, mm, I know it's almost a, uh, an, a thing in itself, you say 2020 and all kinds of stuff comes up for us. It's, it's been a, a, a year of individual and collective trauma generation. And those of us that are doing our spiritual practice, we've been able to move through it uh, maybe relatively unscathed, but I want to say that on the collective level, I don't know about you, but when I watched that inauguration, there was something that was released in me, something that I was able to let go of as I was able to turn my attention to this higher idea of unity. 
And, and that's when I had to look back and see what is it that I want to scoop up from 2020? What is it that I want to integrate and, and include as I move forward towards this higher idea of unity? And I was uh, introduced to a, a, somebody pointed out that I should listen to Brene Brown's podcast from last week and she broadcast this the day before the inauguration and guess what she was talking about? Unity. It's truly up for all of us. We're really calling more unity in. And as I was listening to her broadcast, her podcast, I heard her say something very profound. She said, we can't have unity without accountability. And then she quoted Nelva Marquise Green, who um, has done a movement around healing, around uh, the Sandy Hooks massacre and gun violence. And um, Nelva said, white supremacy is not the elephant in the room. It's the room. Boom. Wow. I heard that and it was like, I had to take a moment and just kind of like think about that. Um, and it might help you to integrate what, what the, the message of that quote, if you, maybe you can digest it better if you think about it as white conditioning. And white conditioning is not about the color of our skin. It's about our propensity to try to create sameness. And when we try to create sameness, we are pushing away the possibility of newness when we can, what, when what we really want to do is begin to embrace all that's before us and include it so that we can move forward in a, in a, a more powerful way. And what I want to say about white conditioning is it's very subtle and it's pervasive and it's, it's as simple as wanting to um, be in the latest fashion and dress like everybody else or talk like everybody else. And, and what happens is it, it shuts us down to the beauty of our differences. If we really want to live in a world that works for everyone, we need to embrace our whole selves and be willing to hold the high watch and clarify our, for ourselves through our spiritual practices wh what it is that we believe and what we value and how can we be in more alignment with it? How can we create more congruency? And how do we then integrate all the differences and challenges that we see before us with this idea of inclusion. And Brene goes on to talk about that oftentimes, instead of accountability, which is what she said is required to come to unity, we often yield the, the sword of shame. And if we're going to walk out this grand vision of a world that works for everyone, we need to individually do some skill building around holding each other accountable. Accountability is a unitive practice where we are willing to lovingly hold each other accountable for our words and our deeds, especially if we're having trouble holding ourselves accountable. And yet, it, <clears throat> excuse me, yet in this current divisive climate of our country, we've been playing out this belief in our separation and it shows up as blaming and shaming and it keeps us apart. Shame is really this idea of where we help to pro, um, promote painful feelings of humiliation or distress. There can be no inclusion when we are shaming each other, and yet accountability is a willingness to accept responsibility, and it is cultivated through open and honest and healthy communication. So how do we get to this radically inclusive future? We do that through self-awareness, being willing to be accountable for our words and our behavior so that they're congruent with our values and committing to the work of integrating the whole self, the mind, the heart, the soul, the body, so that we can really step into this place of a world that works for everyone, that is radically inclusive, that we, that we apply that inclusivity not, not only to the world out and among us and but also to our own body temples, also to our own selves, to bring the fullness of our humanity into this next life, this next world that we are trying to build. We're in a very transformative time right now. 
Ernest Holmes said it this way, unless we become the living embodiment of love and light, we shall have no justification in saying that God is love and light. We have to be it. We can't just say, you have to do it. We can't just look for it out there. We have to be it as well. And so maybe this is what one of my favorite Bible scriptures means. In Luke 10, 27, the master teacher, Jesus, is quoted as saying, love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And then he goes on to say, and love your neighbor as yourself. I think that if we look at this idea of radical inclusion as how we step into a world that works for all, that we really begin to understand that where we've been is a world that works for me. And where we're going is a world that works for everyone. And how we get there is self-awareness, accountability, and radical inclusion. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead and pray. And so I invite you to, to go within, or you may want to raise your eyes, or you may want to lower your gaze, whatever it does that helps you to connect to the allness of who you are. And know with me right now that this power and this presence, this, this radically inclusive, creative life force is forever creating itself in billions of ways over and over and over again. And so that each one of us is part of this creation. Each one of us is part of this world that we see around us, that we feel within our hearts, that we think with our minds. It is the body God manifest. And so I know as we move through our week this week, as we move through this year of looking at this idea of timeless wisdom, an evolutionary vision, that our eyes are open, that we allow ourselves to see with the eyes of God, that we allow ourselves to think with the mind of God, that we allow ourselves to feel with the heart of God, and that all that we do is in perfect alignment with this beautiful vision of a world that works for everyone. And so we move past and transcend and transform through this world that works for me, knowing that now that it works for me, I want it to work for everyone. And so we open our hearts and we open our minds and we allow ourselves to see that which is ours to do. We trust that everything that comes up, the, the peace, the grace, the ease, the discord, the difficulties, the challenges, the complexity, all of it is in the soup. And together we are creating this amazing life that has so much possibility. And so I know for each one that we do the, the joy and the play and the work of self-awareness, of knowing what's ours to do, what's ours to embrace, what's ours to integrate, and what's ours to let go of. And that it all comes together in perfect harmony. I'm so grateful, grateful for this opportunity to continue to recommit to this beautiful vision of a world that works for everyone, to continue to bring my whole self into it. And I know that for each one that we walk this out together, supporting one another as a community, as individuals, and that wholeness is indeed what we experience. We simply anchor this in power and love by saying, and so it is. Thank you.